And right now, we are making change. You know, you never know when change will happen. A friend of mine had said, sometimes change is slow, unless it's fast. <laughs> Let's start with organizing. You know, what is organizing? Organizing is people coming together, finding common cause with each other to help us fulfill our dreams and our hopes, to make this a better world. And what we found is that when you organize, you can change this world. We have changed this world. It's how we got things like an eight hour workday as opposed to a 15 hour workday. It's how we got the freedom to vote. It's how we extended the, the freedom to vote to other people. It's how for many we got clean drinking water and other benefits of a modern society. Now, many of those freedoms that we have are under attack and they're attacked by very powerful and special interests that are not accountable that make our life difficult. You know, in organizing, does organizing mean that everybody gets along and everybody gets exactly what they want. <laughs> you know, what, what is the process like? Like, how does one begin? You know, with any group of people, <laughs> it can be both beautiful and in organizing. We do try to keep what we call love at the center. We do try to build what we called in the civil rights movement, a beloved community. But with any group of people, whether it's a family or friends or a school or a workplace or an organization of other kinds, things can also be messy. People have different opinions. And so organizing involves listening to others, hearing what their stories are, giving people confidence to tell their story and then find what are the common links that we can work on together. You know, civil rights movement is it on the biggest level. Let's just say we're looking at local government. We wanna change stop signs or we wanna, you know, we, we wanna do something like that. And I don't know anything. I just, live in the, I just live in town and I've lived there a long time and I wanna change it. Like, how do I start? How do I start to change it? You know, there's actually an example that I was told about many years ago of people who wanted a stop sign or a speed bump in their community because they were young kids, one who was hit by a car, who was speeding through the community. And they asked the city, put up a speed bump, put up a stop sign, put up a stop light. The city didn't respond. So housewives went door to door. They contacted others. They asked them, have you noticed there's a problem? So one said, uh, definitely was a problem. My child was almost hit. Another one said, I saw my neighbor's child almost hit. It, it's too dangerous. I'll sign up. Another said, I'm not used to signing up. I don't belong to groups, but I'll join this one. And so people talk to each other, talk to neighbors, talk to friends. Who else do you know? They came together in someone's house. They talked about the problem. They said, well, who can make a difference on this problem? Is it the mayor? Is it our city council person? Is it a political leader in the local area? All of them needed to be impacted. Well, then we said, who could impact them? Well, the people from their area are mostly the ones that impact them. Sometimes the voters are ones who impact them. So sometimes organizing leads to saying, let's register people to vote so we can say, we're gonna vote <laughs> and have greater impact on the issue. So those those um, kitchens and living rooms, those discussions, before you ever get to tactics, you know, what are the initial, initial conversations like? It starts by people saying, this is a problem. And I have a problem. I thought maybe it was mine alone. I thought it was a personal problem. But when you hear from others, they've got the same problem or they see the same problem, they realize it's a social problem. And if it's a social problem, 
It needs a social solution. In the early women's movement, we had a phrase, the personal is political. And what it meant was that problems you felt were just yours alone. I can't get ahead in my job. No one's listening to me. I'm relegated to the least interesting work or positions. Oh, it's not just me. Others have this problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could do something about it together. And the phrase, the mm -hmm. personal is political. So it starts with personal experience, understanding people's own interests. It then goes on to building a relationship with those people. And once you've got a relationship of caring for others, then you say, is there a way we can build our power together to actually make a change? So these three elements of understanding people's interests, understanding and building relationship, and understanding and building power together, that's core to organizing. So let's say that we come together, we want to make this change in our neighborhood, you know, whatever it might be. Do, do you have to say, okay, Janice, you're going to do this. You know, what, what is the, the actual mechanism underneath the organization that has to occur in order to, you know, ultimately be the women's march or ultimately be something like that? What are the small things underneath it that are just when it's like 10 people and we're trying to figure it out, do roles have to be assigned to people? Is it decentralized? Like, how do you start to move to make a change? First of all, there are different approaches for different issues. There's not one path. But mm -hmm. generally, people would say, first, you have a sense of where you're going. So you have to be clear about what's the change you want to see. So you have to be clear about what your demands are, what your goals are, what would winning look like? What are we asking for? What do we, what do we want? Then you have to know who can grant you what you want? And so those are the decision makers. You know, just protesting may or may not get you something, but bringing a power to bear against those who are the decision makers, that can move a great deal. So it's the clarification on your goals, clarification on who the decision makers are on that to achieve those goals, clarification of who can bring you the power is it voters? Is it consumers? How, how can we use the press? How are there are there any established interests that would be for it? Are there other elected officials who'd be for it? Are there other corporate heads who might be for it? And then you think about well, what resources do we need to do this? Do we need to raise money? Do we need an office? Do we need to have regular meetings? And then deciding what are all the tactics that we want? Do we want a demonstration to make create visibility? Do we want a press release? Do we want social media? Do we want to tell our story just like you, Priscilla and Jesse, are telling stories online? But it sounds like, the, I mean, there's so much what you're talking about, you know, is literally the, the ultimate organization. I mean, there's such depth, and I know with the Midwest Academy and all the work that you've done, you know, kind of to, to share these insights. It seems a little bit overwhelming though, so that if you're starting with a problem that is personal, to scale out onto some of the topics that I think are top of mind for all of us right now, starting with, are we gonna hold on to democracy? How does one begin without feeling, you know, I'm always overwhelmed. How do you be not be overwhelmed and get and do this sort of step-by-step? Step? Like, how does one think about that? You know. There's a song actually step by step that says step by step, the greatest battles can be won, but it's step by step. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. And the song goes on, and by union what we will can be accomplished still. Drops of water turn a mill, singly none singly none. And so the, the question is joining together with others who have shared concerns on those particular issues. They may have other concerns that are not shared, but by working together, they also might find they have other interests in common. Now, when you start out, it sometimes makes sense to connect with an organization already that's set up and already working in an area. So you don't have to design everything yourself. You've never chaired a meeting. How do you do that? Too frightened perhaps to speak in a meeting, but you're with others who've done it 
who can train you how to do it. But sometimes there's an issue that's urgent and no one is working on it. And by talking to neighbors, people are smart about what they need. They're smart about what they can do. And then realizing you can do it together. You don't need all the answers. I rarely think I have not only all the answers, I rarely think I have very many of the answers. What I do think is I can find a common bond with others and we'll figure it out together. And you know, it's especially important because so much of the society tells us you're not smart enough, you don't know enough, don't raise your voice, don't speak out, fade into the crowd, go along to get along. And it makes us feel like we're not worthy enough. But what organizing does is it says, you are, you are terrific. You're smart, you're good. And together, we can make the change we want to see. Now, in Birmingham, you know, there was the, uh, you know, the marches, right? But at the same time, the marches were going on. You know, Dr. King had others communicating with the business leaders who were, you know, now say they were trying to make the change. But, but is that an important part of thinking about tactics about, because the march in and of itself is not enough. You need to also be in conversation and, and you need to have structures for things like that. Well, in Birmingham, first of all, there was a terrible situation in Birmingham. It was often called bombing ham and black people's lives were being threatened. So people knew there was a problem. We needed to do something about it. And how do we all join together? So people connected and they connected through the institutions that they were most comfortable in. For many of them, it was through the churches. That's what connected the large parts of the black community in Birmingham. There also were people who connected through schools, especially young people. They connected on campuses. They connected through people who were taxi cab drivers or drove their own cars or had a jitney service so that there were ways to have alliances and you built up, okay, I'll support you, you'll support me. Sometimes they're business interests that are in support. Sometimes it's the business interests that need to be changed. And what we really count on is we count on the power of real people to find their voice, to focus on the goals they want, and then to take step by step to advance that. You know, there's a lot of Baptist ministers during the, you know, civil rights movement. Is there something about Baptist ministers that lends itself to these allegiances and, and focusing on these issues? Well, the Black Baptist Church was a well-organized, some call it a free space. And in the times of even enslaved people, it was a place that Black people could go and feel safer or at least with others who had shared problems and shared concerns. And it was an institution. Having an institution in which we can raise our own voices is incredibly important. Now, there are other kinds of institutions like that, and they're precious. Unions are one kind of institution where working people get together for freedom at work, to have a voice at work. It's one of the reasons that there's been an attack on unions over the last several years where many corporate and other interests have tried to destroy them because it is a place where working people get to gain confidence and have a voice. Right now, by the way, unions are more popular than they've been perhaps in 50 years, 71% popularity. I saw something the other day saying, unions are now more popular than hot dogs, which are at 70% popularity, but that's another kind of organization. But there are other organizations, they're youth organizations, they're women's organizations, they're ethnic organizations. And it's one of the reasons that building organization itself is precious, but it takes an effort. So we can have a groundswell, we can have grassroots organizing happening, but I think there is still who holds the power to make the decision. So at what point you know, if we take anything that we might be concerned about today, what is does it take to kind of, un, you know, destabilize or topple that power source so that 
the change that I might want to see can take root. And then also, what do we do about people that are organizing that have completely diametrically opposed desires than I do? Like, what happens when people are organizing on different sides of an issue, I guess, is my question. Two questions in there. One about power and one about polar ideas. It does matter that we build people's power. Many of us have been told power is a bad thing. Don't go for power. But power in some ways is neutral and it depends on who controls it. You think about a light switch. It's electric light. Now we have lights lighting up our, our call right now. And it's a positive. We've got the power so we can be seen. But the power can also be a nuclear bomb or it can be a destructive weapon. It depends in whose hands it's held. And that's why the kind of organizing that I care about is about small d democracy organizing, about putting power in the hands of real people and letting us see the power we already have, but we need to exercise it. And there are lots of ways to exercise it. It starts with finding our voice and speaking out and then spreading that message. It can be person to person, and in person, I actually think is the most wonderful. It can be storytelling like you're doing. It can be in social media. It can be in visible events so that the press then wants to cover it. It can be also going and voicing our concerns to those who currently hold the power, but may not be accountable to people. That may be an elected official, it could be an administration, it could be a regulatory agency, it could be a corporation, it could be someone who's just a bully. Now, the amount of power you need depends on what you're trying to achieve. Right now, uh, just yesterday, I was at an event at the White House celebrating this Inflation Reduction Act. I've worked on that with thousands and thousands of others, maybe millions of others whose name I, I don't know, may never know. I've worked on it for almost two years because I believe that we should negotiate on the price of prescription drug coverage that seniors shouldn't have to fear will be, will be made paupers because the costs of prescription drugs are so great. Right now, that will be capped at $2,000 a year maximum for out-of-pocket expenses. I cared about climate. This is the largest investment in addressing climate and lowering the cost of energy prices. And it also is about making sure that the wealthiest pay their fair share. Now, I've been working on many of these issues <laughs> some issues, healthcare I've been working on for 10 years. I've probably been working on ensuring that there's a fair system where the wealthiest pay what they owe at least as long, maybe longer. The fights have gone on a long time. Each time we engage, we can make some progress, but it was only now that the popular will was there, that we had the organization that we had the elected officials in place who wanted to support it, and that the moment itself said, there's a crisis we need to address, we need to lower prices, and we need to deal with climate and healthcare and the great inequality uh, in wealth that we see in the society. So it all came together, but you never know when that moment will hit, and it's why we need to keep this up, and I view, that it is my life's work to build a grassroots democracy. So when did the idea for the Midwest Academy come up? And was it always as big as it is now? And where these students come from? You know, what was the, the origin idea? Midwest Academy is a wonderful national training center for organizers of all sorts of issues and concerns and parts and regions and uh, backgrounds, whether it's on climate or women's issues or issues of equality, a variety of issues. But it teaches the skills and the strategies and the values framework of building popular power. The origin of the academy really started before there was a center. In the 1960s, I had been very active in the civil rights movement. 
1964, I was involved in the Mississippi Summer Project. Many people watching this may have heard about it. It's when Northern students were recruited to help very courageous African-Americans in the South who were struggling for the freedom to vote. And what we learned is that even against oppressive odds that you could win when you brought people together to achieve a common goal. And that when we organized, we did change this world and we won a Voting Rights Act. I returned to Chicago and I went through training that already existed with community organizational skills from Saul Alinsky, who was in many ways the father of community organization. And we decided to combine the vision and values of the movement organization from a civil rights movement, a women's movement, at that point, a student movement, with the skills and techniques of community organization and combine the two. And we created a center in 1973, we're just about at our 50th anniversary, to train organizers based on our values with three principles in mind. The first, was to actually win improvements in people's lives. So it wasn't an abstraction about we're for, we are for democracy and justice and freedom, but it also means having air you can breathe, being safe on the streets, having more money in your pocket. So concrete improvements in people's lives. The second principle was that we wanted to give people a sense of their own power. So we weren't just winning for others, a benevolent governor or corporate head or even advocate, we help people find their own voice. And the third was to hold those in power more accountable and create structures of change and build popular organization. So we combined movement and organization and through the years, we've won so many things and provided the training and support for building working women's organizations and unions, building educational reform, uh, building efforts around climate, making some progress with the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, making progress on voting and standing up to those who would undermine our democracy while we're trying to expand it. You know, it's been around quite some time. You're saying it's on its 50th anniversary. What has it meant to have that network of past students, you know, in order to organize around a new battle. It is such a joy <laughs> to find people who've been active over years and also to find some who are just coming into activity now. It is the people coming into activity now, the new next generation who need to carry on the work. And I started organizing, maybe I was really 13 or 14 when I handed out my first flyer, but I'll be 77 this year. And the partnership of those who have experience and those who have new experiences, and we work together. Uh, yesterday, I was at this big event celebrating this um, Inflation Reduction Act, and someone came up to me and asked me if it was Heather Booth and mentioned that he had been in a session actually with my husband 40 years ago. And in the session, my husband had said something to a group of young organizers 40 years ago that said, you need to choose your battles and set your priorities. And it's so stuck with him that he said, now he does training and he passes on that same lesson. And I felt that it was a, I was so touched by it. You know, we're always looking for common ground, but but sometimes when we look across, you know, at whoever's on the other side of an issue, there can be violence. You know, is there an untenable line and how do you get how do you deal with violence or 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 hatred? You know, these these sort of what appear to be systemic uh, issues. Different people have different approaches. I believe in having love at the center. It's a major theme. I believe, in fact, if I had said the themes of what I do for my life's work, it's to organize to change the world, but with love at the center. It also means I take an approach that is nonviolent. I think that it supports more of the world we want to see 
and starts to mirror it. I think it also attracts more people to the work. Sometimes we face violence in response to our nonviolent work, even our loving work, because there are forces of hate and lies, disinformation, and just meanness in the society. And I still believe that people are good at heart. And if we reach them and help people see how we can achieve our goals together, we can overcome the forces of hatred and violence, but only if we organize. It doesn't happen on its own. You know, uh, Dr. King had a famous phrase that was something like, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But it only bends when we put our hands into it, our brains into it, our hearts into it. And we need to do the bending. Also, it reminds me, Jesse and I had the opportunity to interview some of the elders and Bernard Lafayette telling us the story. Mm. Beautiful Bernard about, remember that Jesse, when he was at Woolworths at the counter and one of the clan was there, you know, standing on his, sort of on his back and then pushed him down. And Bernard just looked up with him with a big smile. So he's looking into kind of the eyes of a man with the, you know, with the hood on. And he matched that violence with a smile. I will never forget that him telling us that story. And there's something very powerful and beautiful and that is love at the center. But I want to jump to today because it's hard to have love at the center when, you know, some of the things that you fought for, starting with Jane, we're talking about women's right to choose, has now is now back. And I'm old enough also to remember that glorious moment when things change. And here we are now again at the kind of the cusp of what feels dangerous to me. So how do we, where do we go now? How do we keep our, you know, heads on, get the work done? What is in your mind, sort of, you've just went to the White House, you've, all these things that you've been working on, but the work continues. We have issues like gerrymandering, you know, the, the right to vote again is a tricky one. Where and how does the work continue right now? Do you remember where you were when Roe fell? I remember how I felt. I was both outraged and ready to fight back. And in a way, I wasn't surprised. They had been an attack on this most intimate freedom of a person's life, the freedom to decide when or whether or with whom we have a child. What could be more personal? I have two children. I have five grandchildren. I've never had to face this decision myself, but I certainly wanted to have children at the time when I knew I could bring them into this world with loving care. And that now is being threatened. Just yesterday, there was a statement by Lindsey Graham, a senator saying that there should be a national ban on abortions after a certain length of time. This is not something he will ever face, but it's something many, many people in this country will face. And as a result, there is an outpouring there is an outrage. And as a result, there is organizing. There is a rising up, particularly of women, but also of men of goodwill. And you asked about Jane, for those who are not familiar with it. After I came back to my campus in 1964 from the civil rights work I was doing in the South, a friend told me his sister was pregnant and nearly suicidal and not ready to have a child and was looking to have an abortion. And at that point, this is 1965, I say it was a more innocent time and I think I was a more innocent person. I didn't really know about this very much, but I said I would try and do what I could simply as a good deed. So many of our actions in organizing really are just based on our values of caring about other people. So I looked for a doctor and I found a doctor through the medical arm of the civil rights movement, the Medical Committee for Human Rights. And I found a doctor who, I didn't know it at the time, his name was T.R.M. Howard. And he had been a courageous civil rights leader in Mississippi who came to Chicago when his name was on a Klan death list. He made the arrangement and provided the abortion. And I thought that would be the end of it. But the person involved must have told others 
and word spread and someone else called me. I made that arrangement and someone else called. And I realized I needed to set up a system. Now, over time, Dr. Howard was no longer involved. It was another person we had involved named Mike. And more and more people were coming through. It wasn't legal, though it was safe. And we built a caring community. And because we knew that it wasn't legal, in fact, three people talking about providing an abortion in Chicago in 1965 was a conspiracy to commit a felony. So we said, pregnant, don't want to be, call Jane. We named the group Jane. Over time, women who I recruited into this counseling service themselves learned how to do the procedures. And the women of Jane between 1965 and 1973 themselves performed 11,000 abortions. They were safe. They were in a caring community, but they weren't legal. And we really should never go back to those days. And we won't if we organize. And this president has said that if we have two more votes in the Senate who believe in these issues, we will codify Roe and we will advance voting rights with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And so whatever people's background or persuasion, if you care about people, if you care about our future, this is the time to be involved. What are your feelings about climate change? You know, this is a another existential problem that's facing us that one feels powerless to do anything about. But, you know, how can we, when we feel so small, you know, organize and be a part of it? Well, we just made the greatest contribution to investing to address climate change that has ever happened in this country. Year after year, I think 1970, the first Earth Day, was the first day there was a national visibility around climate. 1970, we're now at 2022, the struggle goes on. We make climate change, we make progress, but only when people take action. You know, there's, there's seniors and there's juniors, there's elders and there's youth, all involved about it. Some caring about ourselves and our future, some caring about our grandchildren. Here's one picture of two of my grandchildren. And I feel, though actually this one is now 18. You know, I learned from, from some of the people that we talked to at Midwest Academy, though, actually, that you could be 80 and, and something matters to you and be in, get involved for the first time. In other words, activism is for the heart, right? It's for something in the heart. It doesn't matter how old you are or where you live or what you have. It's that moment where you are compelled to do something. Something is doesn't seem right, doesn't feel right. Is that true? Can we be come active at any age? At any age. One of the reasons we won these changes on prescription drugs that was tied to climate, because it was part of the same bill, was because both the largest seniors organization, AARP, was fighting for it. But it's also true that some of the newer organizations, I just joined a group called um, third act. And it's for people who are in our third act, for people over 60. But there are also youth organizations and all sorts of in-between. I have a friend who calls herself a yelder. She's a young elder. It really doesn't matter what your age is, what your zip code is, where you live, what your background is. It matters that you work from the heart are willing to care about others and yourself and can find common cause and will do the work. So it's not just words, but it's actually actions. You know, um, the Grateful Dead say, what a long, strange trip it's been. You know, like you've been doing this work now a, a long time. What are your observations about it? Does it, are you reinvigorated? Do you keep going? You know, when you look back, was the journey worth the effort? I've tried different kinds of work. I was a teacher. I thought at one point what to be a social worker, but I wasn't quite sure when I was graduating from school what I might do. I have never enjoyed any work as much as I enjoy this. Some days are hard. Some days it's tiring. Some days it's 
even demoralizing. You think all that hate that's out there, but I'm reinvigorated when I see people who are doing the work, who are learning how we, how we make change together. And right now we are making change. You know, you never know when change will happen. A friend of mine had said, sometimes change is slow unless it's fast. <laughs> and you never know. And what seems fast is because you had 20 years of work prior. Mm. But right. also sometimes there's an opening. And sometimes the moments of greatest challenge and hardship are sometimes the moment of greatest change. That was true in the civil rights movement. People were being killed and, and there really was a, a terrorism going on. And it seemed like no one would even care, but in fact, people cared. And because people took action, they brought it to a head and made the change. And right now, I think it's another moment like that. I do think we are kind of on a knife's edge right now. It's not exactly clear and on its own which way it will go. On the one hand, there is a threat to so many of the benefits of a modern world we know. There are threats to democracy, there are threats to freedom to vote, there are threats to reproductive freedom, there are threats to climate, there are threats to whether there are assault weapons on the street. And so there's a threat really of tyranny and hate. On the other hand, there is a rising up for freedom, for democracy, for justice. And so I'm very heartened right now. And you can see it in the numbers of people who are registering to vote, in women becoming more active, young people becoming more active. Do you think, Heather, that the one thing, you know, that you can do and be an activist is to vote? I mean, it is the one thing just to start there. How important is that step? And, you know, you were with people that were fighting for their lives to have this opportunity in the civil rights movement. So what is that, what would you like to tell everyone? I think there is a virtuous circle and many things matter. It matters that we raise our voice. It matters that we join with others. It matters that we show up. It matters that we recruit others, that we talk to our family, our friends, we talk to people we don't know, that we add to our numbers and that we move it into elections and voting. And that after the election, we move it to accountability and support for those policies we care about. And then back again to raising our voice. The vote is extremely important, but I think it's especially important when we tie it to the other work, what I call this virtuous circle of democracy. Heather, thank you so much um, for everything you've done and everything that you continue to do and for sharing these insights and motivating. I, I know me, I feel like I have work to do. There's work to do and to not give up. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Heather, very much. So grateful to the two of you, to the whole project and to allowing people to provide our voice. And if we organize, we can change this world with love at the center. Thanks so much. Again, thanks for including me. Yeah, yeah. Of course, thank you. Yeah, thank you for Appreciate having me. Appreciate you all. Okay, bye, bye. you guys.